today uh, we're supposed to start talking about the neuronal nets, but that was the initial chronogram, right? So basically we would go from like the perception, which we saw roughly emulates a single neuron, right? And then we're going to start stacking neurons in order to solve more complex problems, right? But unfortunately, we didn't get to do the uh, hands-on tutorial. So the first half of the lecture today, right, until the break at the least, uh, I intend to mainly go over the perception, right? I'll, I see that you guys are still seeing the, <laughs> the first slide. Yeah, so the, the first half would be like the quick recap, right, where we're going to cover uh, like just remember things that we discussed so far uh, and then address some questions that you might have. I hope you got the chance to uh, read a, a, a bit more about the material. I remember that we had like a little bit of a, a, a issue with respect to what the linear regression was doing, right? Uh, I think uh, Sebastian in the previous lecture, he shared the link to the material, right? Which basically was just a material that was a linear, uh, a revision on uh, linear algebra, which is essentially what we're doing, right? Uh, we are dealing with vectors and matrices and, and we are solving equations uh, on a matrix form. That's basically what we're doing. Uh, so it, during the tutorial, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the strategies that we use to optimize uh, the uh, perception, right? We're gonna see that although we're talking about gradient descent and like different uh, optimizers, it's nothing else than an iterative way of solving uh, those uh, linear equations that we saw before, right? And you're gonna see the difference of like what changed between solving uh, a closed form problem, like we saw in the linear regression, right? Uh, versus the way how we solve uh, or optimize uh, in an iterative way. OK, and then hopefully by then we're going to have all, all the uh, necessary background, right, that we need in order to start talking about neuronal networks, right, and uh, how we scale up uh, the uh, perception approach to handle more complex problems. And I'm going to finish with like some <clears throat> general debugging tips with respect to how to design a good neuronal networks because that's really where the art is, like with respect to designing neuronal network. Neuronal networks are very powerful, but in the end of the day, it comes down to like knowing how to design a neuronal network problem, right? Uh, okay, great. So like now we start with the quick recap, right? So uh, if you guys remember, uh, we, talk, we talked about what means to solve uh, linear regression, right? With respect to find the optimal set of weights that are going give to me, give me the best approximation of how I can uh, combine the features of my input. So if you recall, x uh, corresponds to my input, like my, the entries of my data, right? And y is what I'm trying to approximate, right? So I'm trying to find a combination of those features in order to get as close as possible to the true value, which is my y, right? And in the process of doing so, what we do is to uh, tweak a little bit those weights, right? In order to find this best combination. And uh, we saw that essentially it stands for, oh, I removed that slide. Okay. But okay, so if you guys remember the loss, right? So the loss, if it's a, complex, a convex problem, right? We said that like, we are gonna try to find a way to formulate the problem such that it can have a convex shape. And why was that? Because if it's a convex shape, I have a, a better chance of finding the points that sort of minimize the loss of the problem. And again, if I'm minimizing the loss, okay, that means that the difference between my approximation, right? So like the way how I'm combining the features of my data is as close as possible to the true values. Okay, which is the Y. Any questions until here? This is all like a review from the previous lecture. Okay, one second. In the meantime, you can think if you have questions. Okay, yeah. So hopefully this is like solid ground for everyone at this point, right? Very well. Then we said that when it's a linear regression, uh, we can very simply just find what's the optimal set of weights that we want by simply solving this equation, right? which at this point was nothing else to say that uh, we are capable of finding 
what's the best set of weights that is going to ensure me that I'm in the lowest point of the loss function, right? And how I do that? By computing the derivative along the loss function, which hopefully looks like this, right? So in this point, we, saw, we, we discussed before, right? That this point where I have the lowest loss with respect to the weights, for example, right? Is going to be where the derivative is equal to Zero. Anyone? Zero. Zero. Perfect. Great. Which is essentially what we are saying here, right? We are saying that the point of uh, uh, the, the the point where I have the weights that minimize the loss, it's where the derivative is equal to zero. Perfect. All good until here. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Then I, I told you that like besides just like op doing this optimization, we can add extra regularizations, right? And essentially those are the other fancy re uh, regression uh, techniques that people use, where it basically stands for like imposing more constraints on how you're going to choose those weights, right? And one thing that we saw as well, that this is not just for the sake of having smaller weights overall, but ensuring that those weights, they're sort of distributed Right, it's also one of the mechanisms that we can employ in order to make sure that this loss function that we're trying to minimize is as convex as possible. And why we want that? Anyone? Anyone remember why we want the problem to be as convex as possible? To get the minimum and not the maximum or any other yeah. local peaks local minimum right yeah because essentially it stands for to make this loss function as close as possible to like a, a parabola or like a bow right if it's like higher dimension and by doing so right uh we have greater ch chances of finding something that looks like the global minima right as sebastian was saying because if I have a loss function that's more complex, I might have several local minimas. For example, D and H are both local minimas of this problem, right? And also I might have some local maxima. So for example, B, F, and J, they are local maximas. And why is that problematic? Anyone can uh, elaborate why having local maximas and local minima in a loss function might be problematic for because our approach of, yeah? The yeah. derivative will be also find like uh, mm -hmm. a, a slope in those points. Yeah, the, the slope in those points, which is essentially the derivative, right? It's like this slope is the tangent to the curve in that specific point. They are also equal to zero. So if I'm just restraining the, pro the uh, process of solving this uh, loss function, just to the fact that the derivative is equal to zero there, I might end up in one of the local minimas, which is not that problematic, but I might also find the local maximas because they also attain the same criteria, right? So essentially those are things that are problematic. So like we want to make the loss function as convex as possible because then we try to avoid those problems. But of course, there are other techniques that you can employ as well. And we are gonna see that once we get to the section of optimizers. Okay, any questions until here? Ah, yeah, that was the figure that I was looking for. I just put in the wrong place, apparently. Yeah, so like that, that, that's the, the loss function, okay? And that's like the dream of anyone who's developing a network or like a, a iterative um, minimization problem, right? Which like, I have this very smooth uh, loss landscape, right? Which like perfectly a bow. So, there is just one point in this whole space that has the derivative equal to zero, which is actually, it's exactly the point of the minima in this uh, geometric curve, right? But most often that's not the reality, right? Like what we see is that we have like way more complex loss landscapes. And then we have to employ more fancier optimizer techniques in order to uh, find the actual global minima that minimize this uh, loss curve. Very good, yeah. So that was all like regression overall, right? And like a little bit of like how optimizers work, 
but then I told you, and people were not as impressed as I was when I read the news on, in, in 2015, is that the uh, uh, perception can be understood as a NAND gate, right? And like from the people who uh, work with design of like microchips, you know, uh, what they have realized is that a NAND gate, right, essentially implements any type of complex function that you want. And the NAND gate can be considered as the universal computation element, right? So like you can implement anything you want with an NAND gate, a combination of NAND gates. Although you make it like a little bit bulkier, right? So you have like, you need more components in order to uh, solve something that uh, another type of component would do. But in the end of the day, you're capable of implementing anything just by stacking like several uh, NAND gates. And the conclusion that Nielsen made back then was essentially that uh, the perception works just like an end gate. Therefore, a perception is also a universal computation engine, right? So we can approximate, it doesn't matter as complicated as it is, like the, any type of loss function, right? Or problem that you're trying to solve, you should in theory be able to approximate the best uh, function by just stacking more and more perceptions, right? But before we get there, right, which is like how we stack perceptions in order to solve complex tests, we decided to understand better about the perception, okay? And that was where we stopped basically. So any questions until here? That was a review of the uh, last lecture pretty much uh, in 15 minutes. So it was like just a, like a very rushed review. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, probably we can uh, move on to the tutorial. So everyone already downloaded the uh, Jupyter Notebook. I don't know, people usually do together? Like they, they run the scripts with me or they just look at my script? How does it work? Uh, yes, it's depending. I mean, if they are <clears throat> not too long in the computation, they can run by themselves. Yeah, uh, but in any case, I think the, the one that you shared there, Right, the Jupyter Notebook already has the outputs, so they don't yeah, need to run. Come, yeah, together. you can come yeah. and, and see how it goes, yeah. and they follow along. And uh, so, uh, give me one second the screen. Yeah, yeah. You you want to show how to do the yeah. push pull again? Yeah, like, like mm -hmm. usual. Um, uh, get into the into the CD, do the git pull. <clears throat> They are sync to synchronize with your local data. Then enter. So it's Jupyter Lab, and this one is the one from last lecture that Antonio is going to go through today. Okay. Right. So now I think I always use Control R. If you remember to get the command of the previous time mm -hmm. and then you should by the way i i turned again the poll for people to make comments about the last lecture so like whenever you want to give me like a feedback about what's the speed in which we are moving through the lectures if you want it to be slower or you feel like you need more material right to support uh to, to make it easier for you to follow the lectures, you let me know. So feel free to post comments on the poll there uh, whenever you want. It's, I'm gonna try to keep it active as, as uh, long as I can. Thanks, Antonio. Um, yeah, uh, so I think everybody's here and then you can you can follow along with, the, with this one, and like usually is also in, mm -hmm. the, um, in the web page under Estimation tree height, Jedi data set perception one because uh, it changes the title. Antonio is the one for two from last last time that you are coming today, and then perception two is the one from oh, okay. the other one from today. Uh, okay, yeah. so go ahead, Antonio, get the okay, shape. yeah. Back here. Close this. Okay, good. So before 
uh, we, yeah, yeah, I think we can just move on to there already. Um, go back to the beginning of this one. So you said to change the names of the the Jupyter notebooks, but in any in any case, like this is the Jupyter notebook that I'm gonna be going over now. It's the one that you're gonna see the image of the perception there, just to make sure that you're on the same page. Yeah. Okay. I just did the title and the start thing. Okay. No, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, so yeah, very well. Uh, this is the Jupyter notebook that we're gonna be using. So uh, as you can see, with respect to the package that we're already using uh, for the other lectures, right? They are just basically just one more package because the uh, SQLearn uh, Pepe was already using. So I think it was already in the, uh, in the stack of uh, packages installed in that environment, right? In pandas, we are already using. So the only difference here is the PyTorch, right? So the PyTorch is essentially the library that I'm gonna be using to implement the neuronal networks, right? But it can also be used to uh, emulate a single perceptron as you, you're gonna see, okay? Uh, everything else here that we're going to see is like NumPy, right, which is this package to uh, perform uh, matrix operations, basically. Matplotlib, probably you have used extensively as well. That's the package that we use for doing plots, right? SciPy has several uh, packages for like data analysis in general, like uh, if you want to compute like R-square, for example, although there are similar packages also in SQLR, right? And Pandas, you're already familiarized with. Very well. So that's the image of the perceptron, right? So as we discussed extensively already, the perceptron essentially combines the features of the data, right? So here we have like the features of uh, sample X, for example, feature one, two, and three. We, and the goal of the perceptron basically is try to find the appropriate set of weights that are gonna get me as close as possible to a desired output, which here we are referring to as being the Y, okay? Uh, so quick question, Let, let's see if, uh, where we stand with respect to how the perceptual compares to the other techniques that we have seen so far. So as we saw before, right, we saw that, for example, a simple linear regression it stands for also finding the set of weights that I can use, right, in order to approximate as well as I can to an output, right? So if I'm saying that essentially the perception and the linear regression are doing the same, what is the difference between them? Could anyone tell me what in the architecture or the structure of those two uh, methods is different? They are stacked together in the perceptron case. So they're mm -hmm. serialized. More, more. There's, well, I would say that the linear regression also uses the same, right? Like in the end, what you're doing is to pass all the samples together also in the linear regression. Uh, or maybe you're talking about batching. Is that what you're Yeah, that's what I meant. So you put ah, several okay. of them together. Okay, yeah. No, yeah, that, that's a thing, definitely. Yeah. Uh, although you're going to see that in the examples that I'm going to cover, uh, essentially what we're going to do is to also just pass like a single block with all the samples all the time. Uh, but you could do batching, and that, that's for sure. Yeah, but I'll, actually, I, I should include like an example of batching because I think even in the neural networks, I'm not using batching. But it's a very important technique. Uh, so just for those that are not familiarized with batching, uh, batching stands for uh, running the optimization in subsets of your whole data set, okay? So for example, let's say that you have uh, a thousand samples, which would be an extremely small data set, but like <laughs> just, just for uh, an example. So instead of you 
try to optimize your uh, model. And by optimize your model, I, every time that I say optimize your model, I always think of like in terms of how I change my weights, right? In order to approximate uh, the output to mimic as close as possible my Y, okay? So uh, what we'll do instead of training, optimize your model with respect to all the samples in every uh, new iteration, you just, you optimize in small blocks. So for example, from this 1000, I get the first 100. I define the best set of weights there, right? Uh, so I tweak a little bit the weights in order to approximate. Then I move to the second 100. So now I go from 101 to 200 and I do this optimization again. So I, in one full pass over the data, you see that I optimize the weights 10 times instead of just one, right? And some people report better performance in doing that, but there are other advantages as well. So for example, let's say that for you to pass the whole data uh, through the uh, optimization, you'd have to have all the data loaded in memory to do so, right? And sometimes the data might be really big. Let's say that you have millions of samples. So you cannot keep in memory all these millions of samples, right? So like then it's a very uh, hardware friendly technique to do that in batching, okay? But uh, uh, anyways, that, that was a completely side uh, comment there. Uh, anyone else can spot any difference between a linear regression that we have discussed before and what we're doing the in the perceptron and what's the difference between them here? Does the activation, activation function has something to do with the question? Exactly, yeah, it's the activation function. So for example, if I just remove the activation function, essentially what we have is a linear regression. Can everyone see that? Right? And, and then we said that the activation function might be very useful for some applications, right? Anyone remember what the activation function might be useful for? I did discuss activation function in the previous lecture, right? I'm not crazy. Okay, yeah, Sebastian's saying that I did. Yeah, so anyone remember uh, what's the good thing about the activation function and how it helps us in general? It lets you put the, give, um, use the output of one module, of one perceptron module mm -hmm. as input for others. Uh, also, but that's going to be when you start stacking the perceptrons, right? Uh, at this point, we're just handling a single perception. We're trying to solve a regression problem with a single perception. So, but okay. there is another advantage as well. Yeah, that there is another, uh, doing this, uh, like regularization of the output, if you will, right? It's helpful for training overall. And we are gonna see this case once we start talking about neuronal nets. But there was another advantage that's very important with respect to modeling the output of the model. Anyone can remember what it was? In any case, yeah, so one good thing about using an activation function is that if you don't have an activation function, okay, your data in theory, right, uh, although we also apply regularization to the weights, in theory, your data could be uh, in the range of minus infinite to plus infinite, right, which is not helpful, right, like you want your data to be in a specific range. So if you want your data to be in a specific range, it might be worth when I change back to the slides and to the Jupyter Notebook, you guys can see that, right? Yes, Okay, yes. great, yeah. So if I want my data to be in a specific range, I can do that, I can enforce that by applying a activation function, right? So let's say that my output, it's not going from minus infinite to plus infinite, but rather going from zero to one. So I might want to use a sigmoid, right? to force whatever output I have coming directly from the perception, right? So let's say that until here, right before I pass to the activation function, it might very well be going from minus infinite to infinite, but I map it back to this range, which is the range that I'm working with, which might be, if it's between zero and one, the sigmoid is the activation that I want. What if I have my, the range of my output to be between minus one and one? What should I be using? Anyone? 
the tangent? The hyperbolic tangent, correct, yeah. If I, I don't have any restrictions about the positive part of my data, but I do want anything, any negative output to just be zero, which type of activation function should I be using? So how do you pronounce the re -alue? Relu, yeah, relu. relu. Uh, yeah. You just say ReLU, or you mm -hmm. can just use the whole name. It's a rectifier linear unity, but ReLU for, for friends. <laughs> okay, so the, the ReLU, absolutely. Yeah. So is that clear how the activation functions work? Is there any question about what's the goal of an activation function? Okay, so, so think, far is the only parameter that we need to select uh, yes because i haven't told you anything about how to design the, the perception yet right but so we're gonna get there so far yeah from the parameters that we have discussed so far that's the only one we did okay okay i i feel like we're in a good place i i feel like most people are understanding uh, at least from the people who are talking to me <laughs> But yeah, so great. Now we go to to the to the uh, tutorial, okay? Uh, and just like I'm gonna try to introduce some motivational messages in, in between my slides from now on, uh, because like I have realized that people uh, are feeling a little overwhelmed with the math and perhaps a little bit of the coding show. But uh, I think that's a very important message. That's like programming nothing else is then just being good at like searching the web for the answers for the problems, right? And I still do that all the time, even for things that I already know, just to make sure that they are correct, okay? So don't feel afraid of like asking questions and Google it as much as you can as well. Very well. So now we fully understand what the perception does. Hopefully everyone here understands exactly what each one of the components of the perception is doing, right? And now let's see how we design this perception finally. Okay, very well. So here, is that better if I zoom like this? Okay, yeah. great, yeah. So let me know if you cannot read what I'm doing there. Uh, but I'm gonna define a class called perception, right? And why is it good? Uh, because whenever I want to change some of the parameters of the perception, I can very easily just uh, re, uh, recall the class, right? I say that I want to create an object with the attributes of perception, right? Please let me know if I'm saying anything that you don't know. I'm assuming that you guys are comfortable with Python already, right? But if there is anything that's unclear, you let me know and I try to explain uh, in a bit more details. But essentially what it means is that like the class perception has few parameters that I give to it, right? The first parameter is the input size, which essentially stands what's the dimension of my input. So like how, how many dimensions or features or predictors I have in my uh, inputs, okay? The, uh, and then I have the output size, okay? Which, what is the output that I'm expecting for this perception, right? Since we're doing regression, and that's perhaps an important difference be to trace between uh, uh, how we set up a percept, uh, a unity for classification versus uh, regression. If it's a classification, I necessarily need to give one output, right? Because I'm trying to predict one value that's associated to the features of the sample, right? But if it's a classification, okay, I, I have as many outputs as number of classes that I have in my data, okay? Which at this point, I'm just telling you for curiosity, but like if we have time by the end of this series of lectures, I'm also gonna try to give you like some examples of how to implement uh, neuronal networks for classification, which is also a, a good thing to know, okay? But because it's a regression, most often the output that we're gonna be working with, it's one, okay? I added one more parameter here, which use activation function, okay? which uh, at this point is doing nothing else than just uh, inserting an activation function, okay? Because I, I wanted you to be able to compare what's the difference between 
when you have an activation function, right? Like this versus when you don't have an activation function, right? And we said that we, when you don't have an activation function, essentially the perceptron is running as, anyone remember what means the perceptron with no activation function? Linear. Linear regression. Yeah, very good. It's just a simple linear regression. Okay, great. I think we're all in the same page. Okay, so what happens here? I, I, I want you to, guys to understand what the perceptron uh, class is doing. So when I have an activation function, you see that I simply first, okay? Let's go per, per parts. Yeah, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so what this uh, NN linear is doing, so NN linear, okay? It's a model from Torch, as you can see up here, okay? Where the Torch here is creating this one, linear projection that we have here. So this linear projection uh, essentially has the weights that I'm going to use, right? To do this transformation from the data space to, a, uh, to prediction space, okay? And uh, it has more parameter suites than what I'm uh, defining here. So for example, if I don't say that I want a bias, so for example, here you see that I also can include a bias Besides the, com the linear combination of the features of the data, I can also include the bias, okay? If I, I say that, if I don't define if I want the bias or not, by default, this linear layer includes a bias. So like by default, a bias is also gonna be learned. And what's the bias for? So for example, it might be helpful for the model to include the offset right, on the predictions that you're, you're doing with the model. So it, besides uh, finding this linear combination of the features, you might benefit from also adding a constant to these predictions, okay? So let's say that after you do this combination, you get to a value of X, right? But in order for you to have the best approximation that you can to the output, right? You might benefit from also adding like an offset. So like a plus 0 0.5, for example, okay? And that's essentially what the bias does for you. But then you might say, okay, but I, I'm still passing this output through an activation function. So like independently of the bias, I'm still gonna be mapping my data to a specific range. And that's true, right? So you see that you might want to use or not the bias, right? Most often people don't even care about the bias because in the end of the day, we're still passing through the activation function. But if you're running this as a simple linear regression, adding a bias might be beneficial, okay? Because that helps you to be in the correct range most often. But if you're using a perception of activation function, the bias makes no difference, okay? Little detail there, little detail. But you see that I'm not even setting the bias. So by default, the bias is there, but like I, I don't really care about it, okay? For this little example of like this perception here, I'm giving you just one activation function, which is the ReLU, okay? So that means, what's the range of my output when, I'm, when I decide to use the ReLU? Anyone? It's not positive. Positive yeah. and, the, and the negatives will go zero. We'll go zero. Perfect. Yeah, great. So what we're going to do, so now I see, you can see here that I have this FC, uh, which usually I use as fully connected, but you can call whatever you want, right? Uh, so I have this FC that basically is doing this job for me right, of combining the features, like, so it's training the, the set of weights, right? I have the activation function, which is this guy here, okay? And that's it. So I pass the input through this uh, linear layer. So I pass the input through the set of weights. So I combine the features uh, with the set of weights. And then I see if I want or not to pass this output, right, which like would be here at this point through the activation function or not. So you can imagine that we have this parallel path here as optional, okay? Very good. So all those things that I just explained to you are also written here in case that you need to revisit this code later on, okay? 
Uh, very well. So I thought that be before we jump into the tree height data set, right, which we are all very familiar with right now, I could use something a little simpler first, which like a uh, synthetic or like fake data, just so we can have a very good idea of what's the problem that we're trying to solve, right? So just for educational purpose, I created this fake data, uh, which you can do yourself as well using these sqlearn data sets, right? Essentially what it does is I say how many samples I want to generate. So I'm generating 100 samples for training and 50 for testing, right? And I say how many features I want this data to have, which is true, right? So I'm generating 100 samples of uh, a 2D problem, right? So I have just X and Y, okay? Here I'm plotting what this data looks like in X and Y. So you see that clearly there is a trend, right? I'm coloring the points according to their values, right? So like what's the value in that point? So you see that clearly there is a trend. So I can very easily solve this with a regression. That's the beauty of these fake data sets because like a regression is definitely gonna solve this problem, right? Very well. So now what are we gonna do, right? So first, one thing that we have discussed before uh, over and over again, is that it's always uh, worth to inspect the distribution of your data set, right? So for example, here I'm plotting what's the range of the value for X and Y. So you see that they're very well behaved, right? They are ranging between minus two and two, which you can clearly see here as well, okay? Uh, and the range of my output, which basically stands for what's the value that I have, which is represented by the colors in this plot, right? They're going from minus 200 to 200, okay? So again, that's X, that's the distribution of X. So my X is ranging between minus two and two. My Y is also ranging from minus two and two. And the output of this model, right? Like what's the value that I'm trying to regress, which stands for the color here in this case, is ranging from minus 200 to 200, okay? Which type of distribution is that? Just so I, I make sure that you guys are familiarized with these terms of like, oh, this is a distribution A or this is a distribution B. Can you guys tell me what type of distribution this one would represent in general? By model. Normal distribution. Yeah, that would be a normal distribution here. Why is it not bimodal? Why is not bimodal? So what means the modal of a distribution, right? If you have a modal one, that means that you have something that either looks like a normal distribution, right? Because you have like a median or a mean that's like more salient in this distribution. If you have bimodal distribution, I should observe two peaks which perhaps you have the impression of two peaks because of these beings that are too big. Maybe that, that's the, the, the thing, right? Yeah, that was my but, idea. Yeah, okay, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, but that's just an artifact because the beings, they are too wide, right? If I had like uh, I see, the smaller yeah. beings, you, you wouldn't see the second peak. So that's just an artifact of the, the plotting. But yeah, the bi I understand why you said bimodal. So could be a, a right answer as well. But the, unfortunately, it's just... Uh, an artifact because you can see that the distribution per se is very smooth, right? Very normal. The, the highest concentration of the data is closer to the center, right? So like this is not bimodal. What would we expect if it was indeed bimodal with respect to this scatter plot, Sebastian? Two clusters. Clusters, perfect, great. So you can see that there are no clusters there, right? Perfect. But that's great, yeah. Um, you, you, that was a nice insight there. Okay, right. So now we are gonna first test in this extremely simple data set, right? Any questions about the data set at this point? So if everyone in the same page, this is the range of X, this is the range of Y, and that's the range of the predictions that we're trying to make, okay? They are all normal. So like, I don't really need to worry about doing any normalization here, right? Because they are all normal already. I could want to have then in a specific range, that's for sure. I, I could want to have like mean zero 
and the output ranging from minus one to one. And then like perhaps finding a activation function that would ensure me to be in that range. Which activation function would be that, by the way? The one that would give me minus one to one? Tangent, tangent. Tang yeah, hyperbolic tangent, perfect, yeah. Right, so why is not sigmoid? Can you tell me why sigmoid wouldn't do that for me? Yeah, sigmoid that is zero to one, zero to one. Uh, Correct, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, so I think we all understand the role of the activation function, right? We understand uh, the setup of this the silly problem that I'm proposing here just for introduction. So now let's see how we can set up the perception to solve that, right? So if you recall, the parameters that I was going to set according to the perception class, right, was the input size. So what's the input size here? So just remembering, right, that's the definition of the perception. What was the input size here? It's the dimensionality, x and y. The, dimension, the dimensionality. So it's true exactly because I have an x and y. Oh, my internet was. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I see that there is a little lagging here. Let me know if at some, some point the connection breaks. Yeah, so the input's true, right? Let, let me try to call some stuff. Maybe it's, uh, I'm using too much memory. I have to submit a paper this Thursday, so I'm making figures. <laughs> um, the Illustrator takes so much memory. Everybody still there? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully this helps. Uh, great. Yeah. So, uh, great. So the input size two here represents the dimensionality of the data. So we said that was X and Y. That's why input size is equal to two. Now output size is the, the dimensionality of my output. So we want the output to be just a single value, right? Because we are running a regression here. So the output size is equal to one. And by default, Am I using activation function or not by default? So if I don't define activation function, that, that's a Python question, right? So like that's a coding question. I want to see if you guys are aware. So if I don't set if I want or not to use the activation function by default, am I using it or not according to this, uh, the way how I define the perception class? No, you don't use it. It's false. Yeah, I'm not using it because it's set to false by default, right? So if I want to use the activation function, I have to actively define it, right? I have to say use activation function equal to true. Then I'm using activation function. If I don't define if I want or not to use the activation function, by default, it's false. So therefore, this is going to be skipped, right? And then we have a simple... Linear. Yeah, very good. All together. Okay. Good, good, guys. I think we are we're moving nicely here. How are we doing with time? Am I taking too slow? <laughs> I'm going to try to move a little faster. <clears throat> okay, so very well. Now we, we need to define what's the criteria that we're going to use to do the optimization, right? So like, what's the metric? We have defined so far the data set and the test. So if you guys remember, right, we said that like whenever we're defining a machine learning problem, I have to define the task T, which at this point we said that's going to be a regression, a uh, performance metric P, which what were the options for metrics? Can anyone list some of the options? Don't look at the code yet. I want you <laughs> to, to, to tell me what are the, the options for metrics. So we we talked we talked about accuracy, for example, right? When do I use accuracy? 
what type of task benefits from queries? Usually classification, right? Now, if I'm talking about regression and I want to minimize a loss, you're talking about mean square error, right? As someone just said in the chat here. Uh, Chomin, Chomin, yeah. As Chomin very nicely said, mean square error, right? So that's the criterion that we're gonna use, right? So like we're, we want to compute the difference between what's the estimates that my model is making and the true value. And we want to minimize the mean square error. So that's essentially what I'm saying here. The criterion that I'm gonna use, the performance uh, metric is gonna be mean square error, right? Which at this point, we're very familiar with mean square error, right? Essentially, it's all that we have been discussing here so far, right? Mean square error, mean square error everywhere. Great. Now I want to say how I want to move uh, in this uh, loss landscape, right? Such that I can try to find the best uh, solution for my problem. So like my best solution would be the optimal set of weights that gets me as close as possible to the lowest loss that I can achieve for that problem, okay? So here, I'm gonna go back to these slides for one second because I want to tell you about the optimization. Okay, here, right? So what we said before, right, is that essentially what I'm doing is to try to find this differential, right, of the error. So error here, we have seen uh, that, for example, as error, we have seen the mean square error, right? which for those who uh, don't remember how it looks like, looks like as the combination of the features of the data. So that's the set of weights W that you see here, right? Here I'm multiplying W by the features of the data. And then I take the difference between this prediction and the true value, the square of it, and I divide by the number of samples that I have, which is M in this case. So that's mean square error, right? So I want to, uh, navigate in this loss landscape, right? In order to find this point here, which essentially would mean that I found the set of weights. So here, just for simplicity, I'm showing just like W1 and W2, okay? So those would be the first two weights. But of course, like in any problem, uh, we would have like more, more uh, features, right? In, in the tree high data set, we have 22 features, if I recall it correctly, right? So I have 22 sets of weights. So it go from W1, 2, 3, all the way to W22, right? But here I'm just showing you. In theory, if I find the best set of weights, the best combination of weights, I would find this point here with the star, right? And this point of the star is the point where my loss, therefore the best prediction, right? My loss is the best one. So that's the best prediction that I can achieve, okay? In linear regression, I could find this point by simply solving, sorry about that, by uh, uh, simply solving this equation, right? But there is a very strong assumption about this, the way how I'm solving this equation, right? Which the assumption that my problem is fully convex, which the, the, the uh, assumption that basically uh, restricts the use of linear regression to many problems, right? Because like I cannot as make such an assumption because as we saw before, the reality and the expectation, they're two completely different things, right? So like I have to assume that potentially I have something that looks rather like this than this, okay? So solving uh, the uh, linear regression like we, we saw here, works nicely for problems that are fully convex, but unfortunately they don't do very well with loss functions that represent our reality, unfortunately. So we have to use something that try, tries to solve the problem in an iterative way, right? Which like trying to optimize the loss function by steps, okay? So how does it work? I take a step, so like by take a step, I choose a new set of weights, right? I compute the derivative, Okay, 
And then I see how closer I am with respect to the derivative, to the derivative equal to zero. Because when I have the derivative equal to zero, I'm in a point where I have the lowest loss, right? In this convex shape here, okay? Am I susceptible to finding a local minima? So like a point where the, uh, the loss is equal to zero, right? The derivative is equal to zero, right? But it's not the global minima. I'm susceptible to that, right? As we saw before. So I cannot use that as the unique criteria that I have, okay? So in order to avoid this type of problem, there is one more thing that you can use, which like to find, to, to define something that we call the learning rate, for example, okay? So the learning rate is a trick that basically uh, 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 ensures you that like besides updating, these weights unique, uniquely based on this uh, on the derivative, right, of the laws with respect to the weights. I also have this term that uh, makes it stronger these steps that I'm gonna take, right? So you see that, like for example, if I'm navigating towards a point of local minima or even a local maxima, right, and I have that point. Is, like getting closer to zero, I don't uniquely use that value, but I, I can uh, exponentially increase that, right? Like make it stronger or weaker according to a learning rate that I want to use, which here is defined as the alpha, right? So what this uh, alpha usually does for you? So for example, it's going to take what's the derivative in that point, right? Which uh, essentially it's what we are observing here, right? I'm gonna multiply by this gamma. So for example, if I have a gamma that's too big, right? So let's say that, for example, here, I had the, this is the, uh, the gradient, right? So you can see that the gradient ideally cor uh, cuts across the elevation lines. So elevation lines is something that you guys from geocomputation are way more familiar than I am. So I'm cutting the elevation lines basically perpendicular to each other, right? Which is essentially the optimal way of crossing the elevation lines, right? It's gonna be the steepest way, but that's what we want. We want to go towards the minima, right? As fast as I can. I could be going like this, right? But like there is a more optimal way of doing that, which is like to cut through the elevation lines, okay? So this alpha is conditioning how fast I move through the elevation lines. If I take an alpha that's too big, right? That's like, uh, it's an alpha that uh, I compute the uh, gradient, and then I multiply by alpha that's too big, I get something that looks like that, right? So like, okay, the gradients here would be like just a single error. But then I say that I want the next step of like how I'm gonna change the weights to be alpha equal to 10, for example. So I would multiply this gradient by 10. So the next, place where this thing is going to take me in this loss landscape would be here, for example, right? Am I still going to converge to the point of minimum? Maybe, right? But you see that my path, it's way more errant, right? Like I keep oscillating way more than I, than I, I, I shouldn't, I should, right? So that would be comparable to, for example, when you have the, the car, right? You pass in a in a pothole with your car. If the springs of your car they're not very good, they're gonna keep oscillating, right? And you, then you're gonna have that effect of like you, you're going back and forth after you pass in the pothole. Ideally, what you want the the springs of your car to do is to just take the impact and then put you in a stable point like immediately again, right? So we can compare this big learning rate to the bad springs that are just gonna keep oscillating. Like I don't know if you guys had an Opala growing up, like Opalas like from Chevy, they're, they're very famous for doing this kind of things. They had horrible springs, but people like the, the swinging of it. But anyways, so you see that like the learning rate when it's too big is also not very good, right? Because some people think like, oh yeah, I want the, the uh, process of like uh, going over the possibilities of my uh, set of weights faster because you have this uh, wrong idea that by having like, uh, adjustment of the learn of the weights to be uh, bigger 
that's going to be beneficial. But actually, that might just make the process of conversion to the point of minima longer because now you're oscillating way faster around the optimal point. Can everyone see that? Also, if you make too small, what would happen? Can anyone perhaps like bring the intuition of what would be the effect of having the learning rates too small as well? It would probably not help getting out of the local minimum. Right, yeah. So like if you come back here, let's say that this is the gradient, but I'm showing like the red arrow, right? Say I, I want the gradient, the, the updates to the weight, right? Which is this term here. I want the, the update of this weight should be just like 10% of its actual magnitude. So if this is the error, my update would be like 10% of this error. So you see that my update would be just here for the first interaction, perhaps like here for the second one, right? So I would take extremely long time to find the point of minimum. So it might be good to be cautious sometimes when you're navigating through the loss landscape, right? Because you don't want to be like jumping from place to place. But if it's too small, it also is going to take forever for you. And sometimes you're going to get stuck in a local minimum, as Sebastian said or local maximum, right? So it's important that as well. Any questions until here? Antonio, if this, not, this yeah. learning rate is a, is, a, is a value that goes from zero to one or is a function of the root mean square error? No, no, it's just a value. It, just, because you see that's just a constant, right? That you're using to multiply the gradient. So it's just a constant. Okay. So for example, the learning rates that I'm using for this problem here, I'm setting to be 0 0.01, okay? So it's just a constant that I'm using to multiply the gradients in every iteration, that's all, okay? But in this, so case, not, so this one, you consider a very fine, very small one or not? So, I rarely, I don't re recall ever using a learning rate that's equal to one. So oh, okay. usually what I want is to, for the learning rate should be a fraction of the actual gradients. So is most often is something that's smaller than one because the gradients, right? Again, the gradient, it might explode, right? And that's something that I'm not gonna explain today, but we have something that's called the vanishing and the exploding gradients. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard that, that expression before, vanishing and exploding gradients. Anyway, it's not really uh, uh, important at this point, but it essentially stands for like the gradients as you keep optimizing your problem, they might just become like in the magnitude of million, the gradient, right? So like it explodes to be like a gradient too big or like also in the opposite your gradients become like 10 to the minus 10, right? So like you want to counterbalance this kind of effects, right? And you want to make sure that you're like always sort of stable. And why is that? Because during this process of optimization, although you're explicitly trying to enforce the network should be as distributed as possible with respect to the way how you assign weights, you might as well still uh, fall in problems like this, right? So for example, the derivative of the loss function with respect to something that's very small, right? Let's say that's not zero, but it's very small, could be something close to the infinite. You see where the problem lies here? So like, let's say that the derivative with respect to this weight would be like 10 to the minus, no, 10 to the power of eight, for example, right? So the gradient is too big. Although this is not really meaningful, the gradient would be too big and that would completely throw off your, your uh, uh, optimization problem, right? So we want to counterbalance this kind of effects, but we, this is still a possible possibility. But good question. Anything else before we go back to the script? So essentially what I described here, it's something that we know as stochastic gradient descent. And it's one of the most popular optim uh, optimization techniques out there, right? And it dates back from the eighties. So uh, old, but gold. Uh, people still use it. I use quite a lot, right? But there are better uh, optimization techniques nowadays, which hopefully we're gonna discuss in more details once we get to neural networks, because that's where 
the uh, better optimizers, they really uh, can make a difference. For perception, the optimization technique doesn't really matter that much. Okay, any questions? If not, let's go back there. So at this point, we know what's the criterion that I'm using. So it's the mean square error. No questions there, I believe, right? And I described also what's the optimizer that I'm going to be using, which, as we just discussed, is going to be the stochastic gradient descent. So I'm going to be updating these weights in an iterative way, OK? And I'm going to show how we are going to do this process. And the learning rate, which I'm using to, multi to uh, do the change in my weights, is proportional to the gradient. And it's multiplied by a constant that's at this point is 10 to the minus 2. Is everything clear at this point? So we have defined the perception. We know the criterion, the optimizer. So I think we are in the point of like do a test. Any questions? No? OK, great. Yeah. Very good. So one thing that I usually do before I train a model is to see how a naive model, and by naive, I mean it's a model that was not trained at all, right? So like the weights, if the model is not trained at all, the weights are just random, right? So like they are just like straight up from the uh, initialization. If my naive model performs well, I know immediately that there is something wrong, either with the data, maybe the data is not meaningful. Let's say that, for example, if I have a data set that's just like all constants, right? Whatever I use to make a prediction, it might just spill out the constants. And then I have performance 100, right? Like my R squared would be one, right? So like, then it's just a way for me to see if there is anything wrong with the data, because like the expectation is that if I use a random set of weights, right, to combine the features of my data, my expectation is that the results are going to be random as well. Is that clear? I think we can all agree that like the result of random weights should be random outputs. Good. So that's essentially what I did here. So we can see that, for example, the prediction, right, the output of my model was something ranging from minus point, point uh, minus 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, when actually the true value, right, was something that was ranging closer to minus 200 to 200, as we saw here, right? So you see that, like, this is just the weights they're initialized as being a, a normal distribution, right? And you see that, like, our value is, like, negative. For example, this slope is negative as well. So this is just, like, garbage, the output of this model at this point. OK, so this model doesn't know anything, which confirms the assumption. It's like it's just a naive model that was not trained yet, right? Uh, one thing that we observe is that the output of this model is ranging from um, minus 0 0.06 to 0 0.8, right? I put this question to you here, but I'm just going to tell you the answer for the sake of time. Uh, the weight of this model, right? Uh, they are initialized as a normal distribution, okay? So because it's a normal distribution uh, with mean zero, uh, we have these uh, outputs that are just ranging from something that should be close to minus one to one, okay? And as we saw here, I don't have any activation function. So essentially what I'm doing is to take the uh, uh, input, the features of the input, passing through a normal distribution and outputting that. So that's why you see that it's in this range, OK? So that's just curiosity for you guys here. But anyways, we see that the output of a random model is garbage, as expected, right? So like we can see that there is nothing wrong in theory with this data set. Now we can finally start training it, OK? So this is the important part with respect to the way how you uh, set up uh, the test with the perceptron, OK? So I want you to pay close attention to this part now. Very well. So I defined the model here, right? The model is the perception. By default, the model is already set into training mode, OK? And what does it mean? 
that means that I want the variables that I'm going to be outputting. So for example, the Y pred, right? Which is the prediction of my Y that's associated to the input X train, right? To be, uh, to carry the gradients whenever I, I have this output of the model. Why? Because this information I'm going to be using once I start doing the optimization, okay? So there is this one thing that, for example, if I just say that I don't want the model to be in training mode, right? I, I want the model to be in evaluation. The output of the model would be just a simple value, okay? And Torch has this thing that's like, if I want to simply make a prediction and I don't want to do anything else with that with respect to optimization, that variable comes cleaner for me. It's just output and nothing else. If I say that's in training mode, I need to care more information about it because I need to do more computing with that because I need to pass through the criterion function. I need to do optimization later on, right? So I need to do more stuff with that. So by default, it's already in training mode, okay? And you're gonna see that like when you change to uh, evaluation mode, things are, you're, it's not gonna make much difference for you, right? But like here, this white pred, if you plot, if you save the white pred as a pico variable, or like you just save as an numpy variable, you're gonna see that this white pred at this point, it's a bigger size than the white pred in evaluation mode. Okay, just because you're carrying all this extra information that's useful for optimization. Okay, M mere detail here. But the only thing that I, I hope you you keep in mind is that when you're doing the optimization, once you make sure that the model is in train mode. So that's how you start, mode.train, okay? Here, I'm gonna say how many iterations I want to do in this optimization. So how many times I'm gonna go over these uh, changes of weights. I defined, and that's essentially what the epoch is. So I say that I'm gonna do 1000 iterations here, okay? I'm gonna be storing this loss per epoch in this variable that I just called all loss, that's just gonna be used for plotting later on, okay? So what am I gonna do here? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna iterate over the epochs, as you can see, right? So I'm gonna go over this for loop 1,000 times, okay? Good. This is the way how I initialize the optimizer for that to run, right? So for example, I zero the optimizer there, right? Because I want to accumulate gradients in the optimizer, okay? Finally, we are going to pass the inputs that are in X train through my model, which is going to give me a prediction that's associated to those inputs, good? Then I'm going to use this prediction to finally compute the loss. At this point, what was the loss that we defined up there? The root, yeah, mean square error. Mean square error, right? So what, what am I doing here? Anyone? Uh, the inputs to my criterion is my prediction and my true value. Y train, right? And the criterion is the mean square error between the two of them. So if you come back here, it's nothing else than performing this operation, right? Where this is the Y pred. Good. Everyone in the same page there? So that's the, what the criterion is doing for us, is doing this thing here. Good. The next step, is the loss backward. The loss backward implements this part for us, which is the derivative of the criterion with respect to the weights, okay? So that's what the loss backward does. So loss, it's, uh, I say, what's the function that I'm trying to compute to the derivative with respect, right, to the weights? So that's another thing that's important. When I'm doing backward, I don't need to say, I'm gonna compute the derivative with respect to the weights because PyTorch assumes that you're already doing that because there is nothing else that you want to optimize besides your weights there, right? So like you see that like, it's very clean. 
Like you don't need to be setting a lot, a lot of parameters because PyTorch assumes that that's already what you want to do. So you don't need to say that you're going to compute the derivative with respect to the weights because it's implicit, right? So I'm going to compute the derivatives of the loss, which we, that's the loss for us with respect to the weights. So all those things they are defined in just loss backward. That's all. Good. The next step is I'm going to take this information that was accumulated, right? So like how my weights should be changing with respect to the error, right? In order to minimize the error. And I'm going to do an update on the weights. And that's what the optimizer step does. And that's it. All this math that we saw here basically boils down to this. Very clean script, right? With all those things, they are like, of course, they are implicit, right? That's like, okay, I'm doing the optimization. So I'm doing loss backward with respect to the weights. So I don't need to define anything else, right? Everything is already defined. I just say that I want to optimize this loss, which I defined as being mean square error with respect to the weights. So loss dot backward, that's it. Okay. Now, why this is backward? That's something that you're going to see in the second half of the, leopard, the, of the lecture, like once we get to the neuronal networks. Okay, because so far we're still talking about the perception. So the backward was implemented with like a bigger picture in mind. So like, it doesn't matter if I'm talking about a single perception or several perceptions. The backward does this uh, differential equation for me, right? And then we're going to see how we can expand that to multiple perceptions at once. Uh, hopefully by the end of the lecture today. Okay, this is a lot, I know. I just want you to, to make sure that this is sort of clear. And if you have any questions that we can address now before I, we move on to like see the output. The squeeze, the numpy squeeze, is it like uh, flatten? Squeeze, sorry, what did you say? The squeeze, you're using the squeeze. Ah, I squeeze. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So th there is this one thing. So, for example, since I'm uh, dealing with torch variables, right? Sometimes this prediction comes. For example, let's say that I'm defining a vector, right? You can define a vector as being a matrix. Better. I'm gonna say that I'm gonna define a vector with just one element on it, right? I can say that's a vector, so it has dimension one, right? One, one. Or I can say that's a matrix that's defined by one row in one column. You see, what's the difference? So like, if it's a vector, I say it's the element one, and it, then it's fully defined. If I say it's a matrix, although it's just one element, it'll be row one, column one, right? So like now for me to refer to that element in that matrix, it's I, I I need to give two informations. I have to give like the row and the column. They're both one, but like I still need to define that because it was originally a matrix, right? So one thing that I usually do is to squeeze all these extra uh, dimensions that I don't want to work with. So I squeeze that. So for example, if it's a one, I just remove that. Okay. So for example, instead of referring to uh, uh, a vector as being one row in several columns, I just give the information of the column, right? Because the one should be taken for granted, right? I, I shouldn't be having to give the information of the row because there is just one row at the end of the day. So like, that's why I squeeze that dimension away. That's why you can, does. Uh, so my question was if you can use also uh, flatten for that. You can, yeah. Yeah, you I can think do that's that. the same purpose, right? Yeah, there, there is just one difference, right? Because I can flatten any array. Right. So, for example, if I have a, a, a matrix that's two by two and I say flatten, that's going to give me a vector that's one by four now. Correct. Now, if I say that I want to squeeze a, a matrix that's two by two, it's just going to say you cannot do that. So the difference is that, for example, if I'm going to try to squeeze the flatten, is going to flatten whatever you give. You see, so it's not specific enough. And that might okay. generate some bugs for you. So I, I want to make sure that I'm only going to lose these extra dimensions when I have like a clear case, which like I only have one row or one column. 
and I don't want to be to be wasting my time referring to the position of the row if I have just a single row. And that's what the squeeze does for you. The flatten is gonna flatten whatever. I can give you like a tensor of like 200 dimensions and it's still gonna, yeah. I, I think it's clear, right? Okay, cool. So that's the squeeze there. Good, uh, any, any other questions? Pepe, let me know if I should stop at any moment. Uh, yes, up to you. Maybe just finish the. Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna show the the laws model, now. Then. Okay. The model performance. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So now I want to see how these laws is evolving over time, right? I again, what we're trying to do is to change the weights per iteration, or the iteration here stands uh, for the epoch, right? In order to get these laws as low as I can right because in, in the ideal world we are trying to approximate something that looks like the, the minima of this uh error curve okay and then if everything went well we should get something that sort of looks like this okay so what i'm plotting here as you can see i'm storing all these laws right that are coming like per iteration so like in the end here i'm gonna have all the losses that I have for these 1,000 epochs is stored in all loss. So I can just plot the all loss here. So what you're seeing here is the absolute value of that loss. So you see that the loss initially was like in 10K, the magnitude of the loss, right? Where I started, right? That was the random point. And by the end, I'm very close to zero by the end of 1,000 epochs. So you see that like we not only found this point of where the derivative is equal to zero, right but we managed to stay there we managed to uh per permanent yeah we managed to stay there we stabilize around that point which is a good thing right we at this point we still don't know if this loss indeed represents the point of minima right we still should be able to verify that by testing okay so now let's do a little test and then i think i'm going to stop Right. So now I'm going to set my model to evaluation mode. OK, so again, here I was saying that like, OK, whatever you give me as output of this model, keep it because I need to do extra computations later on. So here, this y pred, the prediction of my model, carries way more information than the y pred when I say that's in evaluation mode. Because when I say it's evaluation mode, I mean inference mode. So like, let's say that I, let's give an example. Uh, I have a robot that's performing a, 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 an action, it's doing something in the environment, right? And it might be time sensitive. And also like, once the robot's already deployed in the environment, I have limited resources as well. Like I have to handle, like perform these operations with the uh, run memory and CPU that I have available for the robot right now. I cannot send it back like to a cluster and get the results, right? So what happens? I have to be able to run the inference, like be able to like make predictions as fast as I can, right? So that's why you have like, you could be running this is still in training mode. It would just like take more memory, right? But so, like Torch knows that people have different interests when they are uh, training these models. So it makes sure that to make as compact and like clean as possible when you're running inference, because you might have some restrictions with respect to where you deployed it, right? You might want to train your model in a cluster, but in the end of the day, you want it to be able to run smoothly on a cell phone, right? So you, the model, once it's trained, you just want to make inference and then you have to, you want to make it as fast as possible, okay? Hopefully this, it's a technical detail, but makes a difference. And also when you train, you want this model to be trained, you have to make sure that's back in train because in evaluation, you just don't store all the information that you needed. Okay. Great. So now we are gonna see how this model performs. So now I'm gonna get the X test. So if you guys remember here, I created this toy data set with like a training set and a test data set, but they roughly follow the same distribution. So you can see that like the ranges are pretty much the same, right? And the values are also sort of the same as you, I hope you can appreciate by the colors here. Okay, so the ranges are very similar. So now you're gonna see how this model performs. So I'm gonna pass this 
uh, test data set through the model. I'm going to get the prediction, right? I'm going to still compute the loss because I want to see like how well it did, right? But in the end of the day, I don't want this, uh, uh, the model to be trained on that because I'm just running inference, right? I don't have any interest of like seeing, of retraining the model on the test data set, okay? And then I'm going to like plot some extra uh, metrics. For example, I'm going to plot the R value, like the slope of this curve, right? And everything else via using this linear regression, which is just saying like, okay, uh, now compare how this two, uh, my prediction and my true value decorrelate to each other, right? So some people use different tools. For, I think Pepe likes to use SQLearn, right, Pepe? To compute R square. I think I have seen that on your code. Yes, I use the square, but you you can also do the formula or yeah. Yeah, right. I, I use the the stats linear regression where I'm so. just like comparing those two variables, my y pred and the y test, right? Yeah. And seeing how they are correlated to each other, and that gives me the r value of those two, right? So like the r value, I can just square the r value, and get an estimate of how good this uh, model is performing, and that's the r square. That's uh, I think Pepe prefers. So that's the true value by the prediction. So you see that like this model is doing pretty good for this toy data set, right? Like the R, it's 0 0.98. The R square is roughly 0 0.98 as well, right? Because it's just the square of the R value. So we can say that like, yeah, the, this model was performing well, right? But we had no activation function, correct? We said that we didn't want activation function in this model when we defined it here. So now maybe we go for a break and then we see what happens once we add an activation function. What about that? Good? Okay. Yeah. So okay, let's so come back at 50. 50? 50. Five zero. Okay. Okay. No, no, it's 30. So it's a 20 minutes break then. Yeah. That's right. All right, uh, where did I stop? Sorry. Yes, after the correlation between. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but no activation, right? That's where we stopped. No activation. Then we saw that like, yeah, the correlation is good. The slope is like sort of close to one, right? It's desirable. So like, uh, but that was not using activation. So then I said that, like, let's see what happens once we add an activation, correct? Everyone remember that? So, yes. yeah, so now we are going to add an activation, okay? So what's changing with respect to the previous definition of the code that we had before? The input size is still true, so the dimensionality of the data didn't change, so the percent, the the dimensions uh, of this uh, linear layer that I'm using inside of the perception is still the same. The output is still one because this is a regression problem, right? And now I'm setting the activation function to true because as we saw before, by default, it's false. So it doesn't use an activation function. So by actively setting to true, now I add an activation function, which was the activation function that I put there as an option for the perception. Go up in the code. The Lee rule or relu. Yeah. Rectify linear unity, right? Which does what? What's the range of outputs for the relu? I think we need every time the slide <laughs> to to, to re review the activation function shape. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Relu. Okay. From zero to infinity. Right. If it's a negative value, just it sets it to zero. And if it's go beyond zero, it's just like a linear function, right? So it's like x of x, right? Are these described in the in the documentation <clears throat> of, of Torch? Then I oh yeah, so, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let me see. I also had this blog post, which I think it's like really good. Let me open it for you guys here. It's a blog post. Of course, you can find all this stuff in the documentation, like from PyTorch. But I like let me just look. Hmm. 
mm, yeah, no linear activation function, you see? So like you see, you can find the ReLU there. You see that there are like six modalities of ReLU. <laughs> like people get very creative with that. The leaky ReLU, it's one of the activation functions that I show here. Uh, Jellu, it's very popular nowadays, like with transformers. Uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent, which is another one that I use all the time, the sigmoid. So if you click in any of those, you get more details. Mm. Here, you see? Like where they explain essentially what the hyperbolic tangent does the shape of the function, right? But you see that there is no much detail unless you want to see actual code, right? So you want to see how the hyperbolic tangents is defined and so on. So that's why I added to you guys also this, where is the thing? Also this blog, which I don't know who's the person who wrote it, but it's very well written. Uh, so they go over like the main activation functions, right? With like a little bit of comment. This guy, he even makes like a parallel bit, like a, he gives a nice overview of like what's the perception, which at this point we have done as well. Uh, he's talking of activation functions, mainly in the context of a classification. As you can see, you have like more than one node in the output layer. I mean, probably you cannot see because it's really small, but like, yeah. So here, right? So, so you see, by the way, how many classes we have in this uh, layer that he's showing here? Remember that we talked about that, like number of nodes and how that translates to number of classes in a classification, in a network that's designed for classification. Anyway, that's not a big deal. That so would be four, four yeah. classes here. Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah, and then he goes on to like, ah, oh, what happens when there is no activation function, which you kind of discussed already, right? uh binary step function which is also very popular which by the way the binary steps is how neurons actual neurons in the brain they work most likely right but it's difficult to do computation with a binary step can anyone tell me why it would be difficult to do computations with a binary step computations in the sense of like how we would optimize a network that has a binary step output why that would be problematic Maybe I show you this image for like simplicity. What was the problem here? It wouldn't converge to a single solution, I guess. Also, right? But like the, the problem of the- ah, It's not defined then, yeah. It's not defined in K, right? And like when you have a binary step, you see that you have an actual step here, right? So like you don't have a derivative that's defined in the whole domain. So that's problematic. Okay. So although the binary step would be like the ideal approximation for a real neuron, we don't use binary step. We use something that's continuous, which is the sigmoid. Where is the sigmoid? It should be here. Ah, uh, here, the sigmoid, right? Which like you can make this transition like very narrow, like so like this part that's sort of linear, it's almost vertical, right? So it'd be like an approximation of a binary step, but this is too smooth. You can still compute the derivative everywhere, right? It's more details that I'm just telling you about for curiosity. I don't even remember why I came here to this blog. Uh, I think you just asked like for more information on the activation functions, right? I think yes, we will see uh, in PyTorch. Right. Activity yeah. So you can get more information of the activation functions in general. And then if you want to see all the activation functions that PyTorch contains, you can come to, you can just type like torch, uh, no linear activation functions, and it's going to list for you like all the options. And PyTorch has like all of them basically. Anytime that a new activation function is created, they add it here. Good. Uh, let's go back to the code then, right? So like now we're gonna use an activation function, the ReLU activation function, uh, which basically sets anything that's like negative from the output 
uh, of this linear combination, right? So here at this point, if anything that's negative after pass through the activation function is automatically set to zero. And if it's positive, it's just kept the same value, right? So that's essentially what the ReLU function does. Very well. Now you're going to train this network, right? That is using this activation function. So the criteria is the same, which is the mean square error, right? We say that we are to use the optimizer is still the stochastic gradient and same learning rate. Okay, so nothing changed there. Uh, as we said before, I'm going to set the model to the training, uh, to the training setup, right? Because I want to store information that's going to be uh, valuable for me in order to compute the gradient, which is something that I need in order to uh, estimate how much my error is changing with respect to the way how I'm changing my weights, correct? So that's what the optimization does. So if you go back to the code above, you're going to see that the structure is exactly the same, right? So once again, I'm uh, like resetting the state of the optimizer. Here I pass the uh, training samples through the model to obtain a prediction, right? Then here, what, do I, what am I doing here? Anyone? What's happening here? Mean square error. Yeah. 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 Between my prediction and the training, uh, in, in the true labels from the training set, right? Good. And then here, what happens here? So once I, I have the loss, the error computed, right? I need to see how much the error is changing with respect to the way how I change in the weights, right? Wasn't that what we discussed? Because that's essentially the gradient. Yeah. Right? So this is the criterion function. It's what you're seeing here. That's the loss, right? And then I need to compute how much this error is changing with respect to the weights, which is this partial derivative that you see here. And then we said that like, because Torch reads our minds, it knows that we automatically want to compute how the loss, that's why I'm saying that's loss backward, is changing with respect to the weight of this uh, linear layer that I, I have inside of my perception, right? And again, if you guys remember, Inside of Perceptron, I have a linear layer, which contains these weights that I'm using to combine the features. Is that clear to everyone? Is there any question about that so far? Yeah, it's clear. I mean, we need to visual mm -hmm. visualize also fix all the, the, the formula and the link with the, with the code and so on. Right. I think okay. Going. So this is the partial derivative then, right? So like we said, that's the partial derivative here. So that's the partial derivative. And now I need to optimize this way to update the weights, which is essentially what I do when I say optimizer dot step. So like now I know how much I should be changing the weights, right? Based on this partial derivative in the learning rate, right? Now I get the weights that I had and I update those weights by this gradient. And then it takes me like somewhere else in the loss landscape. Like this. Okay. Good. Questions? So that's just what we did like before. We didn't do anything new, right? The only thing that changed here is that now we are adding an activation function. So we just want to see how the model behaves when we add an activation function, more specifically, the rectifier linear unity activation function, the ReLU. Okay, good, great. So now I'm doing everything in one single like cell of the Jupyter notebook, right? So like what this uh, cell is gonna do is to run this model, train this model for 1000 iterations, right? So 1000 passes over this data set in a single batch, because you can see that I'm feeding the whole training set at once, 
right? So just a Bastion comments uh, earlier. So I could be feeding in just chunks of the data, but like because the data is sort of small here, I'm feeding the whole data at once, right? So that's like something that I can do, but like you could be feeding the data in chunks. And then after this thing is uh, done training for 1000 steps, right? I'm gonna evaluate the model. So I set it to evaluation mode. I turn off the grad and then I, I finally compute exactly the same metrics that I was using before, okay? And if you do that, right? You're gonna observe this. Let's try to understand what's happening here, right? So now I see that my output is good for this part of the data. And it's sort of weird here. What is happening? Can anyone explain to me? Why the mode seems to be failing for those points? Because the activation function is set up that way. Aha, like yeah. The, so the negative side of the predictions. Correct, right? So like I chose a, re a rectifier linear unity, right? So the rectifier linear unit just streams everything that's negative should just be zero. So like everything that should be like going from minus 150 to zero, now is just being mapped to zero, right? So you see that my poor choice of, a, uh, of an activation function basically broke my model, right? So you see that like there is no silver bullet here. There is no activation function that does it all for you. You had to carefully choose the combination of activation functions, dimensionality of the layers. So like we have to make sure that dimensionality of the layers is correct. We are dealing with a 2D data set. So we choose a, a linear layer that takes inputs as two dimensional, outputs one value because it's a regression, right? And then we have to make sure that this, uh, the range of the outputs is in the correct range that matches the range of our inputs. Okay, so that's important here. And I hope we can all appreciate that like, yeah, the rectifier linear unit can be very helpful as long as you're making the, the right choices when you're designing the model. Is that clear? Any questions about why that using the, rectifier, the activation function, this specific activation function sort of broke our model? I, think, I hope this is a very simple case that illustrates what the activation function can do in our favor, but uh, apparently here it was not working in our favor. Okay, very so well. In this mm -hmm. case, in, in our case of the of the tree height, this one can be the activation function that we need because we don't need estimation below zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That could be a, a good activation function that you can use according to the way how you normalize your data, right? So for example, talking about the normalization, nice. let's see what happens once you normalize the data. But that's a good question. Yeah, so let's move on then. So now we have been dealing with the data just the way how it was, right? So like that's the range of the data originally, right? So we said that the data was sort of like ranging from minus two to two in X, minus two to two in Y, and the absolute values Right, like the predictions here, they were like ranging from minus 200 to 200, sort of, right? Very well. So now let's see what happens when you normalize this data, okay? So here I'm gonna use the mean max scalar, which at this point, I believe you guys have used before, right? Both because I think I did that in the support vector machine, although I didn't explain that like very much. And I think Pepe also used mean max scalar, correct Pepe? Uh, no, I didn't use it, but you, you were using to explain, uh, yes, the fit, the transformation, and then the transform, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, good. So that's essentially what we're going to do. So we're going to uh, do the mean max scalar, right? The mean max scalar, by default, what it does, and then you can look at the documentation as well.
the min max scalar by default uh, maps your uh, features to be between zero and one. Okay, so that's what the the min max scalar does for you. Let's see if it's actually doing that for our data, right? So like what you see I'm doing here, I'm gonna concatenate this data set, right? So I have the X train. X train, if you remember, it's bi-dimensional. I have an X and a Y associated to it, right? And then I have the outputs. So like what's the value associated to this X and Y, right? This is the one that's ranging from minus 200 to 200. X and Y, like the X and Y coordinates of the data, right? They were going from minus two to two, right? So I concatenate both of them. So like now data train has dimension uh, in number of samples, right? Which was like 100 samples, right? By three columns, which X, Y, and the value that's associated to those measurements, right? It might be a little confusing because I'm calling X and Y. So, but instead, like, say that it's latitude, longitude, and then like a value that's associated to that latitude and longitude, which could be like temperature or whatever. That, that's sort of clear, right? It's just because apparently I'm using X and Y too many times here, but like those are different things. Okay, any questions there? I, I hope this is good. Yeah. For example, the X and Y can be like, uh, I don't know, height and temperature. If there will be a third one, or or is it more like the, the function? That for me, it's a bit. Yeah. Okay. That that's a good question. Let me try to write something here. Okay. So the t the data currently is organized as follows. I have an X. It's a little difficult to do like this. A Y, right? And then I have a target value associated to it, right? So that's what's happening in that concatenate line that you see there. Target. So painful. Target. <laughs> okay, there. So that, that's essentially what you're doing there. Now, what could be your X, right? So for example, uh, what was the thing that you suggested, Alonso? Height. Height. Height? Height of what? Just so we, we know where we're going. For example, elevation. Elevation, yeah. Could be, elevation could be a thing, right? What would be a good Y associated to it? Temperature, maybe. Tem okay, temperature. And, but then those are the features that you're using to predict something, right? Based on elevation and temperature, what could you predict using that information? Can you give me an example? Uh, maybe precipitation. Precipitation, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, precipitation. So yeah, now based on X, with elevation, why? With temperature, right? We are gonna try to predict or regress what's the prediction associated to those measurements, right? So like, I'm gonna give to you like, a, a, those are uh, our samples or observations, right? So like, let's say that's like sample one here, which was like one uh, measuring station, right? Somewhere that had an elevation and a temperature associated to it. And then in that measuring station, I also had a sensor to detect amount of rain, right? Precipitation, then I should be able to do this regression. Good? Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's what we did here. That's what we did by concatenating X train and Y train. Okay. Now we are going to do the, the transformation, right? So I define the scalar. So the scalar now is going to perform this transformation, which means that I'm going to be mapping this data between one and zero. So like the minimal value in this uh, column, okay, is gonna be mapped to zero and the maximum value is gonna be mapped to one. It's a very simple linear transformation, okay? So after the transformation, the minimal value that I have in this column is zero and the maximum value that I have is one. Same thing for the Y. So like minimal value that I have here is zero, the maximum value is gonna be one as well. And because I also concatenate the target, same thing. 
minimum value for the target is zero and the maximum value is one. Okay. So I'm doing that for all the columns, right? Now I did this transformation for data train, right? If I want to see how the performance of my model is doing, I have to do that on the data set, uh, on the test data set, right? But the test data set no longer is in the same range of the train data set because I did the transformation, the scaling of the features and the uh, uh, targets to be between zero and one. So what I do, I train this scaler on the train data set and I don't want to retrain it because I just want my data set to just follow the same distribution of the train data set. So I fit on train data set and here I just use whatever it was learned with respect to this transformation to just transform my data. So like I don't fit again, I just transform the, the test data set, which I think was one of the questions that we had like right after the first lecture. Okay, questions here? And everybody understands what's the difference between fit, transform, and transform only? Yeah, my question just to, to, to verify. If I think I lost Tell you. I can't hear you. It was starting good, but then you stopped. No, no. Not working. Okay. You, would, you can try next time. Well, yeah, if it comes back at any point, you, you can ask again. Okay. So now we already did this transformation, right? So like we did the fit and transform for train data set, and then we just transform the test data set, right? So now we just plot again, the same way how we did before the distribution for the X and Y, right? And beautiful. Like we see that now we have the X in the range of zero and one. We have the Y between zero and one. So those are the two features of the data because I only had X and Y, right? And that's the target, which is also between zero and one. If you compare the two distributions, so like look at this distribution here, right? And look at this one here. They're exactly the same. The only thing that I did was to change the range. Can everyone see that? Even this sort of bimodal thing that uh, Sebastian was, uh, mentioning earlier today is it still there nothing changed right it's except the range and that's a good thing in general right because that means that's a simple linear transformation and linear transformations they're very easy to revert it which is a thing that we is desirable right because at this point let's say that this was precipitation right like as uh, Alonso was uh, suggesting before, as like a potential way of looking at this data. The precipitation at this point is going from zero to one, which like in absolute values, if I got a model that say, oh, you're, you have 0 0.4 precipitation, doesn't mean anything, right? I want it to be like back in the same range that my original uh, target values were, right? Which like in millimeters of rain, is that how people measure amount of rain nowadays? I don't know. Yes, yeah, but like, yeah, centimeters of rain. Okay. So a linear transformation is desirable because that ensures me that like whatever I use to change the range of the data can just revert and make predictions in that domain again. Okay. Very good. So like what we're going to do is exactly what we did before. So like I'm going to do the splitting of the data in train uh, and test data set, right? So like I, I concatenated here as you saw before doing the transformation, and I'm going to split it again. So the first two columns, they were my X and Y, right? Or as uh, we discussed here, could be the elevation and temperature, right? And the last one, it's the target, which we saw that could be precipitation, for example, right? So we do the splitting again to be in X and Y. Very good. Now I'm going to delete the model that I had before just to have like a fresh start, right? I'm going to define the model again, okay? So like now I have the model being defined as a perception. Input size, what's the input size? Yeah, it's true, but what this, this true refers to? 
the size of the matrix? Is the dimensionality of the data, which is like X and Y. So it's like, it's uh, two dimensional data, right? Now the output size is one because I want to spit out just a single value, right? It's a regression after all. And am I using an activation function? I am yes. using an activation function. Yeah, right. Which activation function it is? What was the only option of activation function that we gave in our perception? It was, it was the redo. It was redo. the redo. Right. The criterion, we're going to use the same. So continues to be means per error. The optimizer is exactly the same stuff. Stochastic gradient, right? Using learning rate 0 0.01. These, I hope we all remember what each one of the components are. I'm going to ask just one more time. So what I'm, do, I'm doing this line, and then I'm not going to ask again, <laughs> I promise. OK, I've already the reply. <laughs> yep, of course, uh, you're calculating the mean square error. Correct. Between what? Between the prediction Between of my model? Predict yeah, and uh, actual wise. Now I want somebody else to tell me what I'm doing loss backward. Come on, guys. What am I doing loss backward? Adapting the weight, no, to the Okay, some, someone that's not Pepe. Partial derivative. Partial derivatives of my loss with respect to? I want to see how my loss changed with respect to? To the last step. Yeah. To, to, the, to the weights that I had in the last step, right? Is that clear for everyone? So you find the new weights. No, Antonio. Here I want I find the delta of the weights how, by how um, much I want to change the, the weights, right? So this uh, all this thing here is the delta of the weights by how much I want to update the weights given a learning rate, right? And then you see that's like I'm adding this delta to the previous values of weights that I had before. So this is the new weights that I'm gonna use. This is by how much I want to update. And this is the previous value. So that's old stuff. Good? Clear for everyone? OK. So that's what the loss backward does, is the partial derivatives of the error with respect to the weights. And then I do the step. I change the, the weights, which is this. OK? Mm. Good. Then I accumulate the error in this variable so I can plot later. The loss curve looks very similar. Right, it's good. I'm gonna change the value, the model to evaluation, and do exactly what we did before. Nothing new here, right? Now we see that using the rectifier linear unity, because that's what we said that we wanted to use, right? Now this model seems to be working just fine. Actually, better than it was working before, right? So like before the normalization, let's see here. That's before the normalization. I had an R value of 0 0.98, right? In a error loss, a loss that was between the magnitude of 298, right? Although the fit was good. And now I have R value of 0 0.983, which is not biggest difference because it's a very simple data set, right? But look at the magnitude of the error. Is eight times 10 to the minus four there, right? It's a very small error, right? Which is good, it's very good. And, but we we are using the rectifier linear units now, right? And we saw that when you use the rectifier linear units before, it was not working at all. So what changed exactly? Why is it working now? Because the data was normalized. Because the data was normalized, right? 
because now our data is in the range of zero to one. And the range of the, uh, not zero to one, but the, our data is in the range of zero to one, but our activation function allows, it, allows us to model stuff that are between zero and plus infinite, right? Isn't that the case? Can everyone see that, right? So like now I, I no longer have negative values, which was exactly why this was breaking here, right? Because negative values, they were just being projected to zero because that's what we said we wanted, right? When we added the activation function there. So like, no, I no longer have these problems and I still allow the model to learn everything that goes like beyond the, the zero, right? So you see that now we're capable of like getting the data in the whole range that we want because it's like normalized to be between zero and one. Good. Any questions on this? <laughs> Am I right that all this can also be done with regular curve fitting, linear curve fitting and linear regression? You're absolutely right. Yeah, you could do just simple linear regression because this is extremely simple model, right? It's it looks like very synthetic. Yeah. very similar to it, that as well so right it's a it's a fake data that's meant just for like simple tests that's why i created this one it, visually you can directly say that like yeah definitely there is a trend here right so like a linear regression is gonna do just fine so that's just like for educational purpose okay Any questions before we move on to deal with like a more interesting data set now? Well, for in the sake of time, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, I go until 45, right, Pepe? Right, until 45, yeah. Okay, which I think is gonna be just enough. Okay, great. So now you're gonna see how this perception, which is like this very simple perception that we have, right? By the way, if I wanted to just test a simple linear regression, right? What can I do? How can I transform my perception into a simple linear regression mechanism? Set the activation function to false, I guess. Yeah, and then I have a simple linear regression there, right? So like, as we saw, a simple linear regression would be this case. This is a simple linear regression, right? So like we can see that the simple linear regression after being trained does just fine. So that's the R value for a simple linear regression because this is a very simple data set. Okay. Good. Yes. But now we're gonna, was anyone going to say something? No, no, yeah, I say yes. Fine. Okay, yeah. Good. Okay, so now we go to the three height data set. Okay, which uh, we can see here. This it's a older data set. Uh, that's before like Pepe did some cleaning on it. So I'm gonna show the performance on, on, of this data, uh, uh, the performance of the perception on the dirty data set the, before cleaning that Pepe did. And then I'm gonna to leave to you guys to rerun this stuff on the clean data set. And then for the next lecture, I want you to report me your observations. So I want you to see like what people noted of difference there. Okay. So I'm so I'm gonna go over point, you. One point to, to adding, if you just run in the code, you are going to get this clean data that I'm telling you. Yeah, step. because correct. Yeah, okay. because now the, the path points you already to the clean data set. Okay, so what we're doing there, I'm loading the data set using Panda, right? So you see the read SV there, the path to it, the separation, it's just space, okay? Uh, we see that in this data set, what we have is X and Y and the uh, prediction of the height of that tree associated to that location. So it's no different at all from what we did here, right? before we had like elevation and temperature, that's also suggested, right? And then we had a target associated to it. The difference is that now we have latitude, longitude, and tree height, okay? So we can say that's like, it's very similar to the structure of the 2D problem that we we're solving before. 
It's just that now it's coming from a real data set, uh, data source, which is like this uh, rather uh, equipment that they use to do the same thing, right? Very well. So we saw that the mean max scalar helps. So let's just use the mean max scalar again to transform this data set, right? So we're going to transform the whole thing using mean max scalar. So like data is the whole data. So like at this point, I have no difference between training set and data set, right? So like I'm going to transform the whole data together. So I don't need to feed, transform, and then just transform. I can just transform the whole thing together first, right? So like I'm feeding and transform the whole data set. What's the range of my data after the feed transform of the mean max scalar? It's zero, <clears throat> zero to one, but right. what, what happened, for example, with the negative values, if there were any, what will happen? We, we, we don't have negative values, right? In this data set, because we don't have negative latitudes or yeah. longitudes. Yeah, the transformation is, is, is done transforming any value between zero and one. So yeah, anything get... is going to be just shifted to that range, right? So remember that here, like in this toy data set, our original range was minus two to two, right? And then after the mean max scalar, now it's between zero and one. Although the shape of the distribution is exactly the same, only the range is changed. So like you just translate the whole thing to a different range. And then you, you squeeze or expand it to like fit in the whole domain between zero and one. So the lowest value becomes zero and the high, highest value becomes one. Correct. Yeah. Linearly. Okay. Linearly, yeah. All right. And that's essentially what we see here, right? So you see that now the latitude, which is the first variable, right? Which was the X there. Now it's between zero and one. The longitude is also between zero and one, although it has a sh weird shape. By the way, it, is this a normal distribution? And why is it? What type why? of distribution would it be this? This is a multimodal distribution. Multimodal distribution. Very good. And these, I can't really say what it is, but I would guess that's closer to like a sort of uniform distribution. But the we can say that they're, yeah, the first one, the latitude. So like, we, but we can for sure say that like they are not normal distributions, right? I think that's, I hope this is very visible to everyone. This sort of could be a normal distribution, but it's very skewed, right? Towards like left, uh, so like towards lower values, right? And we have this thing that Pepe uh, did a little bit of cleaning to remove because we have several points that had height of trees measured to be equal to zero, which was just like some uh, plain areas that were sensed, right Pepe? Yeah, agricultural land, yes, mainly agricultural land, bear land. Right. Actually, so, often often the histogram looks like the third one if you mess something with your no data, no data value in images. The third one? No, no it's really be because uh, actually if you run, if you go to the to the to the clean data, that is the one that we, we showed the first time. That value is is really a lot. It's really less now. So yeah, that's share. what I imagine. Uh, can I share one second? But I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, I think it's one of the last. So now is is much less. Uh, it, was, it was the first one. So the, the value is really, really less now. Now I cannot find it. Anyway, um, so uh, I was, was going to point more why the shape of the second 
yes, I think over here I don't have the, uh, the, the, sh the shape of the second plot is due to, the, is due to the, this. Eh? So you have this stripe. So of course, in some point, in some area, in the, especially in this direction, in the latitudinal gradient, you have a lot of point, you, don't, you have area that you don't have any observation. So you have the B model or even three model distribution. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, so the the point here is just that like this data, it's suboptimal, right? Because like it, it has a lot of skewness to it and a lot of entries that are equal to zero. But uh, Pepe did some cleaning, so probably you guys are gonna get even better results when you run on the cleaner data set. Very well, so now we do the splitting of the data, right? So like before we had the whole data together, now we're gonna select part of it to be our test data set. So this segment of the data that's not gonna be used for actual training, just for validation later on, right? And we are gonna select about 30% of the samples to be part of the test data set. So you can see like the proportion of the, the, the samples here, okay? So can someone define to me like what's the setup? of this training? What's the, the perception that I'm using? What are the dimensions? Am I using activation? Sebastian? Um, it's two dimensions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And uh, the perceptron contains a linear um, mm -hmm. function, right? Because it has been defined in the very beginning, it's still the same, right? And um, yeah, am I using activation function? No, because it's not set. It's uh, by definition, it's set to false. It's if it's false, not so given, have... then it's false. Right. So in this setup, I'm running a simple linear regression, right? Right. So, yeah? I was just Anything asking the, 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 the test, the train test splitting, that's mm -hmm. like random selection of, yeah. so there, yeah, okay. It's a random selection. It's like, a, uh, it, it's done automatically by this SQL one function called train test split, which randomly selects some samples to be part of your test data set. Yeah, you can read more about that on the documentation of the SQL learning. It has more options as well. Like for example, the random state. So let's say that you want to have like a reproduce, although the samples are randomly selected to be part of the data set, you can set the seed, yeah, right? I, I saw this, uh, that's very fascinating that you can totally reproduce that. Yeah, which is very, it's very handy in many cases. So it's actually not random somehow. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's random to some extent, like the seed of the randomness, how random it is can be controlled. So it's good because you need to reproduce results, right? Because yeah, otherwise, cool. let's say like I train a network and I obtain some results, then you train the network and you say like, oh, I don't see the same performance that you do. Yeah, you're right. You're lying to me. I'm like, oh, but let's see what's my random state. Well, and then you try to reproduce with my random state. Then it has to match. Then there is no, no crying that's going to justify like differences there. Okay, very good. Uh, so the criterion is the mean square error and the stochastic gradient is actually the same learning rate as before. So I'm not gonna make you guys tell me again what it is. I just gonna assume that you guys know what I'm doing when I say like the criterion, it's mean square error. The loss is the gradients with respect to the weights. This does the step in the optimizer. So that's how I update the weights, right? Then I train this model and bah, pretty bad, right? Looks like a linear regression because that was a linear regression, right? Like we didn't set an activation function. Didn't work. Very well. So what do we do now? Any suggestions of things that we could perhaps do different to make this model perform better for this data set? What we have, we have tried here. We have tried the normalization. So that's like done, right? 
And we have tried a simple linear regression, so no activation function, right? What else could be done with respect to the way how we are setting up like this test, both like with respect to normalizations, right? And like to the way how we're setting up the perception to make perhaps this model perform better. Any suggestions? And then we uh, call it a day. But I would like to hear at least like one, two suggestions at least of things that we could potentially do to make the model perform better for this data. And I'm going to tell you up front that there are perhaps like 100 possible things we could do, but I, I'm going to ask just for two. Maybe create subsamples? Subsamples? You mean like batch it? Like separate the, the normal uh, ranges or, or values? The normal ranges or values? You mean like the ones that are different from zero? Is that what you're saying? Which is essentially stands for like cleaning the data, right? Yeah, the, the, the stuff that they did, yeah. Which Pepper already did. So like definitely that's a thing to be done and Pepper already have done that for you. So I would like you guys to see if indeed that helps or not. So that's one. I'd like one more thing to be suggested. Yeah, Sebastian. Yeah, I expect that there should be some bias in the distribution of the data because we, ah, we did, you're talking about the skewness. No, I'm talking about the second uh, histogram. I would hmm. probably try to uh, train the model inside of one area or something because I see we don't so just like it. over the whole range of latitude values. We. Mm -hmm. So you, you would say like, Something. okay, let's train the model to just model things that are inside of this range. Right. That's it. Okay. I think that's longitude. That's the Y. So that's longitude. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I don't but know. Yeah. That, that, that's a thing that could be done. Yeah. Absolutely. Any Anyone else would like to suggest anything else? But we had two great suggestions already. No, things that could be done in the, uh, in the in data. The in the neural network. Yeah, we could change the, the way how we are setting up the model, right? Like any suggestions on the way how we are setting up the model? What we could do different there perhaps, taking into consideration that we only tried a simple linear regression. We could add the, an activation function. Ah, an activation function. Maybe an activation function is gonna help there, right? Which activation function we could use? The same as before? The same as before. Because we before. predict height. Yeah, we, we could use a rectifier, rectifier linear unit, the ReLU, right? There are others that we could also use. For example, assuming that this range is the one that we want, what else would do the job? So we are just interested in things that are going from zero to one, right? What else maps between zero to one? Sigmoid. The sigmoid also does that for us, right? So sigmoid is also an alternative there. So, okay, we, we have like a couple of alternatives with respect to cleaning the data. One of them Pepe already has done. Sebastian suggested another great one, for example, right? Uh, we have seen like alternatives with respect to what, what we can change in the perception, right? In the way how we're designing the perception to make it better. We could even change like stuff in the optimizer, right? So for example, we could change the learning rate. Maybe the learning rate is too big, right? Although we see that like the loss function seems to be behaving well. So maybe the learning rate is not really an issue. If it was an issue, let's say that the learning rate is too big. What would you expect with respect to this loss function here? The way how it's behaving. Did you grab any intuition about what would be the consequence of a big loss function, uh, a big learning rate for the loss function? It would go up again or back and forth. Yeah, to be super bumpy, right? Remember that we here we said that's like, oh, uh, so where was it? Yeah, so like well, it's gonna be jumping, right? Because here is like where the loss function is the lowest, right? But here is high, here is high. So like it will go from high 
to sort of low, then back to high, then like you start to be decreasing again, low, back to high. So like the consequences would be that this would be like this, right? So that would be a, a indicative that you have a pretty big learning rate. So like if you see that, you reduce the learning rate, right? In this case, it seems to be behaving well. So like doesn't seem to be the problem. Perhaps it's even a, a little, could be smaller because it's going too fast to this point. And maybe it's getting stuck in a place that's not optimal, right? What does it mean? It could be getting stuck in one of those places here, for example, or here, which is not the optimal solution for this model, but they all attain the requirement, which should be that like the derivative is equal to zero. And then in combination with that learning rate was not enough to make it move away from those points, right? So maybe we, we want to also play with the learning rates because ideally we are going to get to somewhere around here, right? That's where the, the loss is the best, okay? Antonio, one question. You mentioned the two activation function that we can use it. Due mm -hmm. to that, you have the similar behavior based on your feeling experience. Do you think they will change a lot or they will be very similar? The result. Behavior with respect to like performance of the model? Yeah, performance of the model. That's what uh, we're going to see in the next lecture. Okay. Uh, or hopefully someone else here, because like that's a proposed exercise, guys. I, I'm serious. I really want you to try like these things that we discussed here. That's so fine. like I, I I want you to play with these activation functions, right? Like so, play with the sigmoid, play with the rectifier linear unit, do this cleaning of the data that we discussed. Like Sebastian suggested one. Pepe already has done one for you. So like that would be like the minimal effort approach, we should be like to see how this model performed on the clean data, right? And then we're gonna see if those things, they actually solve the problem or not, right? And then in the next lecture, I'm gonna teach you even extra stuff with respect to different optimizers, right? And then we're gonna get to uh, like more complex models. So like we're gonna start stacking perceptions. Unfortunately, we didn't get to that today, but I feel like we did good progress here. So like, I'm not sad that we didn't get to neural networks. But I feel, I feel like that you guys understand how the perception works now. So I hope I'm not wrong. You guys yeah. understand how the perception works? Yeah, I think okay. we are in a better state also to be able to read the help when we are mm -hmm. reading uh, the, the manual. Um, right. So for example, I was reading today the the lecture that you, I mean, this blog that you were pointing, I start to understood what was going okay. on. I was reading one week ago, probably I didn't catch anything. So I think we are in a better state. Yeah. Yeah, I agree on that. I, I think that's the best, you know, because like in the end of the day, there is no way that I'm going to cover everything with related to this topic, you know? It's like, it's impossible to even keep up with the literature. Like machine learning is exploding all the directions possible. So as I said, like here, you know, I'm not exactly sure if I'm a good programmer or like machine learning designer, but I know that I'm, I'm very good at Googling answers, you know, like, and that's the best we can do. You know, like my, my goal is to make sure that at least, you know, what you're looking for when you go Google by yourself, you're like, I roughly, I want something that does this. What's the best activation function that would like model this data set that looks like crap now, but like, like uh, maybe this activation function is gonna help me, you know? So like find the right combination of like tools. Okay. I think we stop here then. And then we start on like, I want you guys to bring some proposed solutions, right? I want you to try this stuff that we discussed. And we send that to you or we keep it for-, yeah, send, for Okay. Send that to me, yeah. And I'm gonna say that the deadline it's a uh, a week from now would be tough because that would give you like another three days after I show you like some solutions to the problem already. So like maybe Tuesday. By Tuesday, I, I want you guys to at least try one of these proposed solutions, okay? And then we see how that thing performs. And by no means I expect you to get like a R square equal to one. Like that. That's not the goal at this point. I just want to see what you guys thought would be like perhaps a good solution to to solve this problem, okay? And then we're gonna discuss some of the proposed solutions. 
that's it. I just want you to, to try stuff. I don't, don't want you to necessarily find the best solution. And then you're going to see I, what makes him, makes sense or, or doesn't. That's may it. I ask a last question or one? Yeah, question? of course. Yeah. Um, why, um, why did you normalize the data? Why I normalize the data? Yeah. Do, I do, do we need to do that? Or is that just for aesthetics or you did it before? Or... That's a common practice, I would say. Okay. You know, because like we are going to see that but the, and that's something that we discussed before, which that like normalizing our data generally helps because it just okay, makes but, the life but, of. But this mm -hmm. is not the problem that the activation function is then missing because I would also think that we somehow normalize to get the data in the, in the system of the normalization function, what we had before that all the negative values went to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and so that doesn't introduce additional problems because, and the result of yours, mm -hmm. the very last uh, cell, you mm -hmm. can clearly see that the data goes down to zero and that's somehow strange. And then it, it has some sort of cutoff there. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, absolutely. You're correct. After all, what you're doing here is nothing else than a linear regression, right? So like we didn't need to normalize it necessarily. So I did the normalization because that's something that is going to be helpful once you start using activation function. <laughs> but like yeah, until this think. point, yeah. But here we are but, not using an activation function, but we normalize the data. And this is somehow strange. The normalization you can always do. That's not necessarily okay. a, a bad thing. The normalization is something that I do regardless. Like I'm going to, okay. oh, I'm going to, ah, Antonio, can you help me to analyze this data? Yes. The very first thing I'm going to do is to normalize it and then plot the distribution because I want to see how it looks like. And then one thing I probably look up in the manual because I don't want to frustrate mm -hmm. everyone, but uh, to, to scale back the data, I guess this is also included mm -hmm. in this normalization methods, right? In this class or yeah. in this data. So for example, to, to transform, we use feed transform or just transform. Ah, okay. And then right? there's but inverse. And then there is inverse transform, which okay. undo the scaling for you. Great. Okay. So yeah, no scaling by hand anymore. No, no. That's part of the past. Just adding, it's gone. Just longer. It. <laughs> the, the transformation is mainly due because in this way, the weight, they are not related to the dimension of the variable. It's the same reason so, why you do the transformation for the linear regression. You scale between zero and one. In this way, the coefficient is linked to the, size, to the same size. So it's the same concept in the neural network. So you, if you, you have two that, I'm not exactly sure. Oh. If you, you have two variables, mm -hmm. one is going from zero to one, and mm -hmm. one is going from from zero to one hundred, and you do linear, you do a, just a linear regression. Your coefficient is function of the weight, is function of the dimension of the variable. Rather, if you normalize, then the the coefficient is a function of the correlation. So you can see which one is the most important one. So it's the same concept. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's essentially what we're defined there is that it's a linear transformation. So therefore it should be comparable like. Uh, okay. So it's the same, yeah. it's the same. Yeah, that, that, that's case. the, yeah, that's granted to you because it's a linear transformation. So like any linear transformation has several properties, right? Which like scalability and that's yeah. like, if you do a multiplication, for example, if you, you have a line, if you multiply that line by, not, not multiply, if you translate that line, the slope should be the same, right? So like those, those are all linear transformations that you do to it, right? So, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Unfortunately, I have a meeting in three minutes. Uh, so I will have to go, but like, feel um, free to drop me any message via Slack if you have questions. Those are things that I'm going to take in consideration at the beginning of the next lecture. So like, so we'll we can try. discuss those and try to do this exercise, okay? And as I said, there is no right and wrong. Actually, there are some wrongs, but we're going to learn from the wrong as well. So just try whatever you think might be helpful here. And then we're going to see like some cool stuff, okay? And That's then fine. I'm going to call on some of you to present what you have done. I'm going to get like 
two or three people to randomly. I'm going to randomly select two or three people to show me what they have done, like in the class, like in the beginning of the next lecture. So make sure that you do something. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.